Welcome, everyone, to another weather edition, Adventure into Reality. Today, I'm joined by Andre Hodge and Sean Bond. Welcome to the show, guys. We're going to let it rip. We have titled this The Naughty Episode. <laughs> uh, hey, mate. Hey, Sean. Yeah. How you going, Sean? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm up for... <laughs> like working with Andrew and, and you here to offer an avenue of the reality in our history that's probably quite a bit in amnesia, but it has a underlying awareness with people. Um, I, I sort of had a bit of a summary for this episode um, because what I found from doing um, conversations with Andrew and the recordings is that throughout history there seems to be a commonality with relationship with the weather and then researching, say, a lot of these gods and, and deities throughout history, it seemed to me that there was, there was a commonality with the apex of many of the gods with the regions, such as Thor, Zeus, Jupiter, Baal, Horus, and all that, that all had a relationship with the weather. And I found, to me, I see that, that as a pattern. And I was really curious about it. And Andrew and Sean here can can expand greatly on on those sort of themes. So, what? Where do you want to start, Andrew? Weather gods, <laughs> gods in general, weather gods. Whether it's Jim the weather god, Joe the weather god, or Thor, <laughs> <laughs> they have specialized names that create mythos beyond them and beyond them, that leapfrogs through time, that activates people's race amnesia. So Merlin brought in the fog. Normally I don't talk about him, but I guess in this naughty episode we're going to break the radio rules. So gods, 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 and wannabe gods all pretending to use the weather via technology or spirituality. Well, I can, I can sort of offer another pattern um, because I've done a lot of recordings with Andrew, and this, is, this goes to the industrial internet era of the last, say, 300 years, and what Andrew suggested in that was that there was a priest versus wizard battle, and um, the wizards were blindsided over playing a shorter game than the priests, and a lot of them were eliminated, and in this last century, Andrew, what happened to a lot of those wizards? They were re their jobs were replaced by technology, and their lineages were new given new jobs to be bankers and managers of a new system that no longer required wizards to upkeep a sacred geometry system. Everything would have been made digital through satellites, through an omnidirectional broadcast frequency. So they no longer needed to create the infra, infra, in the sacred geometry structures, nor needed to upkeep them. Plus there was an elimination of lineages and things like that. So yeah. the, re the reason why I wanted to offer that, and we can start backwards as, as in now where we're at, I guess, is that today, Andrew, who or what might a lot of these ancient weather wizards and beings that had a relationship to the weather in that respect, what might they be doing today if they're still in this reality? Well, if they follow the line of ancestral cursing, which most of them are, they're IT experts, they're... Uh, middle management in banks. Some of them are marketing but or executives with golden parachutes leading variety of types of lives that are middle management, blue collar, but never being able to get to the peaks of what they did before. They feel the energy moving through them digitally but can have no control over it. And I guess what I was sort of offering is that a lot of these weather chasers, the adrenaline junkies that follow the hurricanes and tornadoes and stuff, you said that they had a relationship as well. Is that correct? The majority of them are old, old weather wizards who are still chasing the storms, literally. Mm -hmm. They just, it's so ingrained into their soul that to go and do that because there's magic within every thunderstorm and every tornado and every hurricane if you know how to activate your internal frequencies yeah yeah i guess what i what i perceive a lot of people and, and this is the the important thing why you actually are public and offer readings is that when you actually offer someone their actual soul history and soul truth and which is amnesia you you actually 
uh, complete a circuit and, and the knowingness kicks in. And that's what I love doing the classic collars because I know that they feel their truth on a level that yep. they weren't able to perceive. And I guess this is a sort of, you know, that, that instinct, instinctive sort of desire to follow the storms and stuff. It's sort of, you can actually uh, connect some dots as to what might that be in the past, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I also I asked Andrew before this recording was there's a common theme with a lot of people that find him that they're actually ship captains in a past because the seas were a very big part of um, our history. And um, you actually said and that... The captains had to know some level of esoterica to be able to transverse the oceans. And at that era, captains were the... Being a captain of a wooden ship in that era was the apex of consciousness exploring, meaning you had to learn a tremendous amount of sea knowledge, knowledge as well as the, the esoteric va values. Because sea, seamanship had all sorts of gods and superstitions that were attached to it. And as you became a more potent captain via based off your experience and knowingness of the weather, many of them, like the, the Vikings that transversed the ocean to go in and do invadings, had their own weather gods that they would they would you know, look for omens for to understand, and a lot of that would be weather-based intuition that evolved into an entire magical pro process that involved, yes, a weather god that at some times was direct manif directly manifested in front of them mm. via, via technology or spirituality. Yeah, because what I was trying to connect the dot with, because I asked Andrew this question before, is say a lot of people that find Andrew now, and this might be something that people can tune into in their, their self, is They've probably been a ship captain at some part, but they've also had a weather relationship in a different life uh -huh. that we're sort of suggesting here. That was something you said as well, Andrew. Yes. A lot of ship captains were wi wizards in their own right, where they could manifest. Have you ever heard of what's called St. Elmo's Fire? Yeah, yeah. That is when your the mast of your ship starts electrical frequencies and starts glowing, as well as different parts of the ship as the salinity of the water and the electricity flow in the air creates this electrical was well, electrical light show that goes all over your ship. Um, and there were those that were masters of that. That when you began to feel that frequency, you could actually teleport a ship through space time. <laughs> right. So there were those that. The knowingness of how to create that energy in heavy fog mm -hmm. or high stormy seas, whatever was their need to get to that high energy frequency. And once they had that, teleporting through space and time onto another surface of water, be it fresh water or ocean water, based off of their ability to remote view the place they were going to. So oftentimes these ships had a captain with lots of esoteric knowledge and 30 to 40 remote viewers who would make a consensus of where to teleport and jump the ship to. Now, this is not the average captains were learning that, but that was the apex of what you would want to learn. Was that common knowledge then? Just above common knowledge, you, you once you were a ship captain long enough, you realized there were those that knew how to get from one part of the ocean to the other at an unimaginable speed, and no one else could figure out how they could do it. Are you picking anything up, Sean? Oh, yeah, I'm writing a lot of shit down that I'm tuning into. The The teleporting chi uh, ship thing is really interesting. It makes a lot of sense with the what I tune into back and in, forwards in time, like with um, various stages of a lot of the um, renaissance of sailing periods of time, like for different civilizations as they're coming up and in their peak and what they do and how they travel multidimensionally besides like all the other mystical stuff that happens to you when you're sailing from sea to sea, that, that, that makes a lot of sense with what I just see when somebody just, uh, their ship just suddenly moves across like vast distances really fast and I don't know what triggers it. <laughs> so that makes a huge amount of sense. So thank you for that. Um, the entire ship from the ground up is a ritual and ceremony in which the spine of the ship would have all sorts of esoteric rituals that could bind lineage ancestors of previous ship captains into the spine of the ship, which would give 
direct ancestral actions. Oftentimes when people are on boats, they don't have direct access to their ancestral homelands. But when they build these ships, where what I what I call, you know, ancestral ships, you know, they're built inside. So every every aspect of every piece of wood that it's alchemically selected to be able to make the ship create that St. Elmo's fire, you know, alchemy so that they could transverse time space. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm getting that there are ones that still exist to the present as well as yep. is there a, there a version that are able to go uh, off world too? Especially yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> as well as in like uh, like when they're clearing, I'm getting that they're less and less and less for this, but like time travel too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and off world yeah. connection as well. I remember you doing a threading for this this. Um, pretty amazing girl in, in the LA region and she she was one of the few divinity path beings that you've actually read and you talked about her and her current partner in the 1800s being lifted off in their ship by a UFO and stuff like that. That was interesting. And uh, my other question, I... I'm born in LA, and I've just been here my entire life. Uh, why did I incarnate here in Los mm. Angeles? You were, you didn't incarnate there on purpose. I can tell you that. That you were brought there by the sacred geometry mm-hmm. system to make sure that you didn't connect to ancestors or or advanced personalities that would lead you into a colonial life right at your birth. If you had your life would be very, very different. You would have been a, a master ancestral communicator by the time you were seven. By the time you were 13 or 14, you would have been a master astral communicator, both living and dead. Um, by the time you were 15 or 16, you would have been part of a dreamtime society in which you lived um, many dreaming worlds simultaneously. Because that's your purpose this lifetime is to be a multidimensional, multifunctional being of light in all dimensions and time streams connected as an I am presence and not disconnected in this world of separation. You're a divinity path being, and that means you have a divinity path life ahead of you when you accept it into your sovereign soul. I've been accepting it more, that's for sure. I'm going to let you lean on a little something. In 20 years of doing this, um, I've only met maybe 13 divinity path souls this lifetime. That's how rare they are. I've never mm-hmm. never had an actual divinity path living soul uh, as the I Am Presence on a radio show either. And when I saw you send your little thing in and I read it, and I'm like, divinity path soul, I had been literally waiting for this 20 years for one to come on air in, in awareness or unawareness of how incredible the lifetime that you could have if you can just break through the barrier of, of the fraud belief system you've inherited and see that there's a whole new belief system that your light body frequency has that's willing to co-create with you a way to deprogram this fraud reality so abundance is here and it's never going to be a fraud reality again for you. Mm-hmm. I feel that. Am I living in a no time zone? No, you naturally create your own no time frequency um, when you go through kundalini raises. When your kundalini raises a a peak, whether you're having sexual encounters or not, um, it still reaches a peak every 90 days and then you're going to have your no time experiences based off of that. If your sensuality and sexuality are balanced with a, 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 a proper partner, doesn't matter if it's male or female, that can reach you to that moment of climax, you can increase those no, no time moments daily if you have a ceremonial expression in which to convert the sensual sexual energy into ceremonial healing for yourself or for others or for your, your family. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Wow, I, uh, yeah. I'm actually kind of speechless, and I—it's pretty cool. Well, I um, as soon as I actually saw your first video, I was—I uh, was—I knew that we would get a chance to talk. So I'm really grateful for that. Thank you so much, Andrew. 
you are so welcome. You know, you know, you're a special being to me, and and, and in in the cradle of my voice is a a way to not impress and shape to you, but for you to take your own sovereign power. You know, you have specific rules of how your soul can be read. And I've talked about this on air before that literally some people in their frequency have say, Andrew Bartz's, do not tell this person about this, this, or this. It's written in their soul contracts. You're a little different. You come with the divinity path stamp on you. That means anything that I do is going to have divinity path results to it. And that means your soul is meant to work on a very large scale. But right now your I am presence isn't cued in to what your divinity path soul is doing. And that's a mistake. And this is an example where you have to put your soul or your dreaming body in time out. How do I do that? That's, that's an individual expression. I can give you ideas that before you go to sleep, you say in contract revocation style that this sleep is the I am presence's sleep. You are to create and only co-create with this I am presence to get deep relaxation and hibernation. All other dreaming missions are put on hold in time and no time as I begin to receive the synopsis of what all other bodies are doing that are in the benefit of this I am presence. So I am no longer in unawareness. To begin to say, to use the words, I am now auditing all of my experiential bodies for whatever they're doing on all dimensions and time streams, and I'm sharing this audit with my spiritual cord of equity, which is all of my ancestors, to find out if you have a rogue blue body off doing something that's creating karma for you in the future, which you do have. That's because you live in the sacred geometry mm -hmm. city of Los Angeles and all the suburbs around it. You're inevitably going to get caught up in that. It is it is definitely time for you to get out of L.A. I'll tell you that. Whoa. Okay. Where to go? Okay. Where would you go? <laughs> well, I really loved I really I really love Japan. I would love to live in a city again. I I like it there. I don't know. I or maybe. Think about it. Portland? I have no clue. I'd have to do some research. Really give it some potential and thought, some really hard philosophical thought of where do I want to live? Where do I want to make my my future? Hmm. Okay, what other kind of questions? Uh, can do you I have? ask you a question? Um, I have a question about, about me and my partner. Maybe... Okay. Um, if you can sure. talk about our relationship and yeah. What's his name? I don't really have a specific question. His name is Gareth. Gareth. All right, just give me a second here. Um, the last lifetime you spent with him was in the Roman Navy. You were invading. Cyprus. You, you, this was a really bloody battle. Um, you were both on the Roman Navy side by Gen, uh, Admiral Quintus Caltilvius, which is a sacred geometry crest name, which you have both been brought in. You were both ship captains. Uh, both ship captains landed on on, on the Isle of Crete. 20,000 troops invaded the island, and they began taking over sacred geometry structures there and then they captured an underground chamber there so both of you are part of a expeditionary force to capture sacred geometry buildings and temples and underground technology so why is the why are you together now mm-hmm you're both explorers, both got pulled into the exploration net, both were part of the Malaysian expression into the secret tables where the gold was. We go back, skip points, third timeline session, fourth paradox. 
He's a time traveler. Knights of Malta, really, really big within him. Knights of Columbus, really, really big in his family lineage. Well, how do you relate with them? Multiple divinity path births. Both male and female. You got a lot of information. You actually got to turn the skill up here for a second here. Mm -hmm. Process this. All right, here we go. 1883. This is this is the the lifetime why you you are with him now. The the lifetime that brought you together is this Roman expression where you invaded Crete and you found uh, an underground cavern and inside that underground cavern were actually UFO vessels that were unmanned in non-working order um, like hundreds of them like a repair facility that had been abandoned um, and this was a massive awakening for your soul and many of the Roman troops and, and those that were um, invaded this island uh, invaded Crete and then began to be aware of what's down there, went through massive awakenings themselves, and then there was this big backstabbing where assassination groups came in and just killed everyone that saw the truth of what was down there, so only a handful of people knew that. So you, you and him were both killed, you went to the astral world, and he got put into reincarnation, you got put into reincarnation because you were Roman captains under, under the scourge, um, got separated, and in 1883 is where both of you are both basically slave members on a, an industrial ship, a British industrial ship, where all of a sudden, how do I describe this? Uh, an off-world species called Vorak um, came and basically picked the boat up out of the water, <laughs> took the whole boat, brought it onto their ship, and then began psychically dissecting everyone that was in there. And they began understanding that that uh, both of you have timeline technology built inside your DNA. They didn't understand why. They began doing experiments on you, and your bodies left your soul. Your your souls left your bodies, and you all of a sudden died. And you were in the astral world, kicked out of the reincarnation grid. Suddenly, on the incarnation grid, you know that you were supposed to be in the reincarnation grid with him for another hundred years. So this, this species that you know screwed up and killed you by accident actually tricked the system to, to think that you were an incarnating soul and not a reincarnating soul. So this is why you're with him, is because literally some Vorak scientist was screwing around and hit the wrong button and you died. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Divinity path meetings. I mean, the truth is stranger than fiction. I'm reading it right out of there, and I mean, I'm laughing at myself. But the system can't can't figure out a fourth dimensional being is going to hit the wrong button. Fat finger. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. And, and off world yeah. connection as well. I remember you doing a threading for this this um, pretty amazing girl in in the LA region, and she she was one of the few divinity path beings that you've actually read. And you talked about her and her current partner in the 1800s being lifted off in their ship by a UFO and stuff like that. That was interesting. Yep, that happened frequently because many of the ship captains became. Course, course charters through the great unknown of space. So human beings have this ability when they're in a small collective with advanced technology, they can amplify their ability to remote view nothingness and chart a course through void space. So it, it greatly amplifies a ship's ability when you have these types of assets on there. And these ship captains who would reach a certain level of knowledge of pre-teleportation, -tele pre-teleportation, post-teleportation, or by location of the ships, many of them would be given offers to come on a ship and do something else instead of a wooden ship, it's a spaceship. Same concept, it's just you're in time space, not on a planet. 
and it wasn't hard, it wasn't a long leap for these captains to understand the transversing of time and space throughout the multiverse is just a planet. Mm. And when you have you like, know, an era, you could have 50, 60 million ship captains, and let's just say a million of them of those those 50 million are above mediocre. That's a big pool of potential good ones. So I'm getting that there are, uh, especially like into the now, there's some ancient ship parts that have been stolen uh, from various factions to bring that magic into new ships yep. to be able to keep that going without knowing everything about the technology. Um, but then learning about it through the act of it and then... Oh, man. Um, <laughs> and like shock like depends on where you are and like all these different factors who's going who's involved the room of viewers like you said and i'm getting also realm jumpers yep. that tra- okay yeah transverse seas also like earth does this by locating things with realms from other uh places that link to various places in her like like if you're at land teleporting then that would be like through the sacred areas and the chakras and the like because I'll, I'll call like the whole system from meridians upwards in the different octaves of different nodal points and crosses chakras I, I it's whatever but yep. like um yep. for <sighs> this is really cool <laughs> um <laughs> okay so there were times, so, there were times let's say in our ancient history let's go to let's go to king arthur's era where they would build four five six thousand of these specialized ships that had the technology the esoteric technology built into the construction and then the operators the operators were the most important piece to this technology without the operators it's just a normal wooden ship so once they had the operators imagine 4,000, you know, knights that are armed with sword and shield and horse and so on that could manifest anywhere in time space that water was accessible via these boats, whether it was river or lake. Yeah, the constant theme I get from you, mate, and this is always downplayed in the, the awareness in our society is that it's always about our skin suit, our DNA technology, and... Um, we're, we're made to feel like we're not much, but it's our technology that is the completion of pretty much everything that's going on here, and that that's just an example of it to me, mate. Yep, repeated example. Well, I don't know. Oh, you got more stuff to go on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's say with this continuing example, 4,000 ships, you know, that could be as much as 16, an army of 16,000 that can suddenly manifest anywhere in time space simultaneously in many spaces at once too if the the practitioner force was capable of of mass duplication which many of them were so an army of 16,000 can be 700,000 based off of the infrastructure of duplication meaning what what wizards were working with the the the, the group okay because then there were additional technologies that could be added to the ship which is basically like a like a center crystal that can make it fractionalize itself through time. And then it would be able to do multiple time missions simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't matter. A sword is just as good as a gun when you're trained to use it. <laughs> yeah. And there were simple things that can be done to a average knight's armor that could make it, you know, much more durable for long term. But a, a application of light make the surface of that armor 10 times more dense than what it would and actually make it way less just a light application alone yeah because most sword fights are really they're not battles that go on for hours they're very like short term sort of you know what i mean just just to be able to take a hit might be enough to to defeat that that opponent in that moment so i get that endurance battle and most 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 of them at that time at about 40 to 60 minutes before they they couldn't even move anymore well i've, I've got a game of thrones link for you then because sean's here and we we're, were talking about game of thrones <laughs> before and and one core theme of game of thrones is the valerian steel that the apex of the hierarchy sort of have 
this this right. particular metal that's very specialized and stuff. Do you want to explore we that have, quickly? We have something like that here in our world. It's called Damascus steel. And even to this day, they cannot reproduce Damascus steel. You look that up. It's one of the most yep, ancient yep. mysteries that is out there. Damascus steel. How the hell did they fold this and make the steel and make it at this level of, of, of you can't reproduce it even to this day? Yeah, because yeah, you know, yeah, and they say they reproduced it, but they didn't really, and they just get kind of close to it. Yep. There was, I remember there's a pole and an iron ore pole in India somewhere that they can't equate to how it was made or the fabrication either. You know, I remember. I there's one in Japan that's like that too, a sword that they can't identify how it was created. Yeah, like those ones like uh, that never um, stop being sharp or can't break, and like there's like there's all these co cool sacred objects that just look like a normal relic until like you start working with it. Um, and, and you realize I, you know that is not normal at all. <laughs> yeah, but again, again, most people in this reality um, apply what we've learned via this reality into understanding stuff like that. But if you if you take on board the unseen and the metaphysical, which is what we're trying to do with the storms and stuff, is that it's obvious. But you have to actually penetrate your unknown to actually incorporate what might be, because truth is not what we're told. It's it's there's that's how Andrew's whole role here, you know, so um, mm. Truth is an unlimited point of view and you're going to be surprised what has been done in the search for the unlimited point of view throughout history mm. Mm. So flying, pi flying pirate ships through space has happened many times and there are quite a few grades who nearly shit their pants when they all of a sudden saw a wooden ship flying through space because <laughs> it broke all of their scientific rules too because it was the engine system, yes. Because I think mm. there's a movie from 1981 called Time Bandits and they're pirates on a wooden ship. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah, I need to actually watch that. I know it's there, but I haven't actually watched it. So that's something, some soft disclosure homework, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like Treasure Planet. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I just tuned into a concept that like came to me. Is there like a, like I'm tracking back this traveling mystery school island that has multi-dimensional ship harbors. Yep. And yep. like a lot is very, it's very. Called, it's Infidel Island. <laughs> so the TV series Lost has a good representation of what these islands do. They, they, they change time. They can move to different oceans. They can move in different times. They can be under whatever moon or star pattern you want them to be under, which from a wizard point of view means the most potent eras of light or crossing of the eclipses, you could teleport your island to perfect viewing of it. Mm. To enhance what? Whatever rituals you were doing at that time. To create mm. ships that can travel through space-time. To create vortexes right above the island to to warp things through time and space. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, like, goes into Lost, like, how they needed to reproduce the entire crew that they needed to get to the island originally in a uh, perfect equation. Same thing with the ships and the various uh, crew that I see to reproduce the same effect. And the spirits in them. Yeah, you just take out some of the, you know, the other, you know, modern lost stuff and you get look at the core, the core mechanics of what they're trying to say. Paradox. Yep. So great. Belief mm. engine system. Yeah. <laughs> One person's paradox is another belief engine system. <laughs> there are those that use paradox to their advantage. Yeah. Yeah, as a technology. Yep. Yeah. So I don't want to take away from this this stream that we're going on, if if you want, but <laughs> maybe maybe I'll bring it back to say these captains of the ship and the um the relationship to big storms and weather, and then we can go back to the gods a bit further back after that, if you want. So, yeah. Um, every everyone has had these moments where you know a storm is coming. You look at the leaves are turning white, and deep down inside, you know a storm is coming your human body can sense the change in pressure it is something that has been in your lineage 
thousands of times being a human wherever you were in the world, pre- weather and pressure was related and when you became a captain of the ship you became very attuned to the weather because the lives of hundreds were in your hands it was a great responsibility and that is where those skill sets of being a good ship captain turned into psychic skill sets precognitions omens and all the other esoteric tools that were used to remote influence understand move the weather change the weather or just help you understand who else was remote influencing the weather many of the british captains in the height of the the big wars were esoteric practitioners of weather warfare and so were the French and the, and the Spanish. This is why so many of these gold ships went down during these times of hurricanes, because it was the only way they could stop, you know, 500 boats of gold coming to Spain that was going to upset the entire balance of power. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so I was tuning in, like, remember in the beginning of the call, I was tuning in to... Uh, something that just like hit me out of nowhere with a big like attack and a telepathic test message that was barely any, any more than a poke, but um, it w- it would be them trying to stop us. But uh, in the Solomon Islands, there seems to be some uh, ships that don't want this information out, which is interesting. But they can't really do anything. Um, yeah, that's really. Um, cool that that manifests like that right before we start talking about it yeah that's because we're about to out where their island is and they got to teleport it and move it <laughs> <laughs> guys solomon islands exactly you're getting a red alert all over your ships red alert red alert yeah well a lot of a lot of tropical cyclones originate in the coral sea region that's for sure um i know there was a big one in that region and why do you think there was a major battle between the Japanese and the Americans called the Battle of the Coral Sea? <laughs> it was who's going to control the weather control technology on those islands. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm like tuning into a whole bunch of stuff there besides like what we mentioned. Oh, my gosh. They're like trying to hijack a chakra and use that for weather warfare. Uh-huh. Um, like there's... Uh, Huh. Yeah, devious little pricks, aren't they? Right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things we could talk about on this <laughs> object. Well, this is, um, this, is Operation I, this is Operation Naughty, so... Operation yeah. Naughty, exactly. <laughs> who's been naughty and who's been <laughs> naughty? Do you mind naughty, if I list, naughty like... Naughty in the reality or resolution uh, for the whole universe? That's yeah. what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Mind if I list some things that I wrote note as like um, sure. advantageous to go over for this topic? Yeah. Um, okay. So besides like, uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, so there seems to be something going on in the North Pole with rituals to, I don't know how, how to explain this. It's kind of like if you were to see the, the three Dantians of the body as the main access control panels, like the heart, the third eye, and the gut brain. Um, it's kind of like that with something with weather patterns with the North Pole that's they're being trying, used. They're trying to keep the ice locked as ice because trapped inside that ice is old programmed water that could undo the system. Mm, yes, thank you. Thank you for putting that Old well. Old tools that have been suspended as part of their ammunition in case they needed to use them in another era of time. And now the way the weather patterns are creating resolution, all of those weaves of ice could come undone and suddenly they would no longer have that reserve to call upon. Mm, so I guess I can see where the propaganda is going. Fear of the melting ice caps, you know, they're projecting their their fear of the result of what would happen into us so we could create what they want. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's all about reality control. Because, yeah, that's one that's so, one mechanism to, to observe what is being offered in the public is it's actually the way that the intent of the fear that they want to instill in the public is their fear. And, and we just take it on board. So you can actually reverse engineer what their fear is. So it's like, yeah, cool, let's go for it, you know. Exactly. 
transmute it. But you were talking about the weather relationship and the chakras, Sean, of the Earth. Sure. I, I'll, I was, I was I'll go on. To... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, besides the ley lines and the chakras and the crisscrossing and the different meridians, if you would see it like a body and ter axis terminals that can be used in alignment or dominated, whatever way the the beings are fucking with the te uh, or working in alignment with the technology, whatever. Um, that will also apply to above ground as well as below ground, up and down, um, micro and macro. Um, so you can also see uh, and find where that is in the, the sky as well as how that works with the weather patterns when a certain cloud crosses over a chakra and what you can do with technology as like if you were to see your 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 body supercomputer that can uh, energetically extend itself, um, you know, through through time as well as space, uh, and kite itself into the elemental existence of that weather formation cloud, whatever uh, mist, steam, and work with that as a technology through that mystery school of clearance, um, and grow bigger and bigger in that elemental extension of themselves uh, and be able to flow. It's like whenever you're working with an element, uh, it's, it's mm, not, it's like, like Andrew will uh, go into like how it's really uh, good to like, it, the, it, I'm trying to put this into words. So like Indian, um, uh, spirituality will go into surrendering to, uh, to source earth and uh, to to bring that into an understanding you're surrendering you're not giving up who you are you're not you're become you're surrendering for all negative versions of yourself that are in in disunity with the planet uh, so that earth can flow through you and become one with you and work with you and empower you to take up the chains that are mostly veiled in secret um, as well as ancestry ancestrally dumped on karmically for resolution etc so that everything goes faster you can do that in resolution with the weather as well because the weather does so much for the land over and over again and it has also a system of um, being in health or dishealth such as with deserts and how uh, people can work with the land to repair the weather patterns of the land and uh, upgrade themselves to work with the sylphs and like uh, there are different elementals in the air that want to summon versions of themselves as well as the entourage of sylphs anytime like a chemtrail comes over and they can then just eat it for breakfast and then um uh, activating those chakras so that they're less suppressed uh, definitely goes hand in hand with helping Earth and the various uh, consciousnesses on her surface acting as an amp uh, amplifier for her will or in opposition, whatever. Either way, they kind of grow. Um, it, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah, go, I'm going off subject. Yeah, well, no, no, it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> I, what, what I got from you there is, and I can drop this for Andrew, because I don't think it's public in the recordings that I've released yet or been working on, but you mentioned how um, in California there was 30 years of drought and a big storm last year ended that drought in one day. It in one storm, one yes. One one-week storm. The entire 30-year 30 drought, 30 drought came to an end. Yeah, so it's like what you were suggesting about working with the elementals and repairing the land and stuff and how yeah. things that seem so epic can be resolved very quickly, you know? <laughs> so what it was was there were two tropical cyclones, separate cyclones, one that hit Hong Kong and one that went through the Philippines that went both to the straight to the north to the Pacific Northwest, which is if you look at all the 
the wire spaghetti frame models, none of them almost never go to the Pacific Northwest. But two in the same year went to the Pacific Northwest, and there were 60-mile-an-hour winds. A big storm turned out to be nothing, but ultimately it still created like 90 inches of rain that fell over all of Northern California. You know, it, it, 90 inches was off, but it, it, it refilled all the reservoirs, all the lakes, everything. It ended a 30-year drought. And the interesting thing was the media was really playing that up and it dissipated. And then people were going, WTF thought, media? <laughs> thought the dams were going to break. The dams didn't break, did they? No. No. Mm. They held. And that was a big moment in back in time of different chess moves that uh, saw that drought and wanted to repair it. That's right. um, uh. <laughs> it was a big wound that was healed. Huge wound that was healed. Which, which kind of shows you about the like mystery school setup with the weather patterns and like how you can, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll surmise that they're going to be uh, hurricanes over here at this period of time during this season as well as uh, tornadoes in this uh, area and all these different types of weather patterns that a person could go through in mystery school of understanding yep. so that they can work with so they can extend themselves into them forwards and backwards in time and go through the process of mantle place and responsibility uh, protecting that ability and amplifying its ability to heal the planet so that they grow and they come in unity with all the other spirits that are working in that technology at that time because it's a big um i don't know how to describe it because there's a lot of things going on but there's it's definitely a, a collective meetup of so many different beings all at once and some aren't aware of every layer of it but then like it's organized if you 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 set it up to understand every little bit of the equation um this is why i call all these storms time vortex storms every hurricane has a time travel aspect to it a rift value factor that transverses things from one frequency of time to another as a process of remedy and resolve every storm is the collective and the uncollective creating a tug of war which creates the eye of a hurricane i'm, I'm getting also just as this is a metaphor as well it's the Godzilla concept, where um, yep. this enormous beast that we're so powerless against to to defend ourselves against, his whole target is this big uh, big enemy that he's perceiving, and we're in fear of him because we feel insignificant. But in actual fact, it's an ally on a greater scale that's there to protect us, and that's that's the metaphor that Andrew was sort of saying with this weather because it's about resolving karma basically on a massive scale and clearing the the demons and ghosts and the sacred geometry infrastructure in a whole region that gives people a mean and a necessity mm. to relocate which clears it because they harvest from us to, to maintain their place so i i mm. see that metaphor mate <laughs> it's interesting yeah oh and that also brings into like whole lifetimes of uh beings besides us and like uh, also us that have been on like islands with uh uh more interaction with these tropical storms and hazardous weather patterns and had to grow up needing to be in the because we're in the thick of it grow into that ability and manifest it to be able to uh influence a hurricane or to steer a tornado away from your village or whatever it is shamanically in alignment with the weather pattern because you it does have consciousness it can not like you it can like you and it could like pick you up and gently put you down or it can throw you through a house mm. um so or all of a sudden you're not in kansas anymore toto <laughs> <laughs> yeah and teleportation yep <laughs> I can see though what you're sort of saying is that what you've you've offered Andrew as well is there's an elimination of the shape shifting technology and um, perhaps in relationship to the weather we would shape shift into another form to work with the weather is that something? Um, that's a little stretching for people's consciousness right now when you're a shape shifting format. You have much easier ability to use the elementals 
to change the very fabric of reality. Right now, our DNA skin suits are, are instruments of experience with the fabric of reality that's related to the global narrative. As soon as the global narrative changes, our ability to change the fabric of reality will change. We're a placebo engine right now, a global placebo engine with a global narrative driving the placebo engine at a global scale of awareness. And these storms have a way of altering the global narrative, just like earthquakes can. There's nothing else really that can alter the global narrative short of a nuclear war or a hurricane or an earthquake. Thank you for bringing that up. Because a lot of people don't like go into the need of why we are remaining in this state for a global narrative of remedy and resolve. And until after a certain point, the, the reality rules do change. But until then, we should mostly be focused on what we can achieve through this narrative. Exactly. Through the narrative of changing it within is, is finding your own way to heal yourself, nurture yourself, and expand your point of view so ultimately you can perceive an unlimited point of view without limitations and constraints. Hmm. So like uh, the into the shape-shifting thing, like like with the Game of Thrones warg, like where you could like uh, remo- uh, unentangled observer or direct uh, kind of I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like a, you can either do it dominating or in a union with the animal spirit where you are uh, you walk in in influence to the body uh, in a spiritual, like, commerce kind of way that you could also give upgrades to the animal while you're doing it so they gain from the experience, as lo- especially if you keep them out of harm's way. You could do, like, a similar process with the weather um, in yeah. its consciousness exchange and perception such as with the eye of the hurricane having a huge technology into itself in the center point and actually having uh, a wind elemental type of perception in seeing I, I don't know <laughs> well, well, Storm, the, the being storm in X-Men I can see that you know she she taps into the weather and, and works with it you know I, I think that's a fascinating yeah. concept that's offered so is there an esoteric format into the the understanding of how you bring the eye of the hurricane into this DNA skin suit's eye of perception, like, I don't know, by clairvoyant? See, by seeing the eye as a massive spiritual cord of equity that has the elemental storm cloud beings or the the things that actually create the fabric of the global hologram as part of the collective and uncollective debating through the acts of weather and lightning and the programming of water because what is a hurricane a massive redistribution of newly programmed water and it's the newly programmed water that will saturate the fabric and change the very fabric of the hologram think of how much water is being moved in these hurricanes whole oceans of water so maybe Andrew at the end of the first recording, you sort of offered it a potential for people to tune into it. Do you want to do a similar thing now in rounding up sort of this conversation? Mm, no, I'd rather them go to that and wait until Hurricane Irma is a little closer before we give them the next mission. Okay. They still need to observe it for what it is, a massive process of remedy and resolve, and those that create the very fabric of the hologram and the global narrative have to function within technological or esoteric rule structures and they are influencing the fabric creation of the hologram and the hologram can no longer respond in the same ways that it did before the law of diminishing returns they have created an abnormal pattern and every time they try to change that pattern something very negative boomerangs back onto them in some other part of the system the system Mm -hmm. now clearing things out that should have been separated from the timeline density 30 to 40 years ago. That is why you're you're seeing all this water being stirred up because a hurricane is above the water. It also stirs up the great oceans below. And once you start this this convection process of stirring up the old programmed waters that suddenly becomes moisture that suddenly shoots to 60,000 feet and is fully exposed to the sun for you know days before it turns into rain and goes back down. You have fully sun-programmed and consciousness-programmed water replacing and saturating someplace that may have been a massive sacred geometry system trapping ghosts. 
So see it as a massive spiritual cord of equity. And you're not choosing a side. You're telling your story. I want my karma resolved. And this system can do it through simply by reprogramming the water of the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have a lot of compassion for the people that yeah. get affected. But there's, they're not really probably accepting the metaphysical and the ghosts and stuff like that. So unfortunately, when you avoid stuff, the commonality is you get a hard lesson and a challenge, and that, that might be the trigger for that individual, you know. I, I appreciate also, that. Also, the controllers like to have innocence around them so that more are affected because it creates this other feeding ground of misery, mm -hmm. okay? So they yeah. like to be surrounded by innocence, and they like to see storms batter their cities. But this storm is a very different storm. They can't alter it. They also know that their sacred geometry systems are all going to be affected, both digital and physical. Nice. So I, I'm I'm tuning into with especially with the uh, well, well, last seasons actually, um, Israel, uh, Los Angeles, and Japan's weather witch systems seem to be doing some really uh, um, naughty things. Yeah. We got to pull out the wooden spoon. <laughs> right. Um, mm, ooh, is there a concept with uh, underground weather, like uh, like with systems of collective consciousnesses in crystals, as well as ancient technology, like control room systems for weather? Yep, there all of that exists. Okay. Yes, some beings are trying to find them negatively um, they won't. ultimately all of those weather rooms are locked out they can only observe the weather that's why you okay, still have cool. to manifest a, 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 a group of people that can actually alter the weather that's why you need a group of remote in remote viewers who then graduate into remote weather influencers who then graduate into weather warriors who then graduate into weather wizards so you need a humongous pool of genius spiritual people to maintain this infrastructure. Mm. Wow. Yeah. It takes a lot of energy <laughs> to develop that talent, I can see. That's right. Without the talent, they can't do it. And now there are those out there that have the technology to do it, but it isn't the same technology that is found in the control room. It is vastly inferior. But we have the right infrastructure personalities. You can get superior results yeah. superior results because it's still a placebo based belief engine this whole this whole planet this whole hologram yeah so guys do you have anything else to offer on this this um i don't know what to describe this 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 theme that we've gone on well we we decided to bring these shows together to let people explore weather in a different way in a different perspective what sean and andre and myself have brought up are new ways for you to think multi-dimensionally apply these techniques in a neutralizing format now that you have awareness what are you ultimately going to do with it here is where you begin a new chronicle your personal weather chronicle and that can be a challenge for all there, those out there. Over the next seven to ten days, a Hurricane Irma is going to get closer and closer. Record some of your experiences sending energy to that storm, seeing it as a method of remedy and resolve. What can it resolve for you? It is, a, is it, an, it is an engine that is simply waiting for you to make your testimony to it of what is going right or wrong within your life. See it as something you can tell. Not justice or judgment. Very cool. Mm. Thanks, guys. All right. Catch us again on the next incredible episode of Weather Edition Adventures into Reality. Peace.